Hi everybody, my talk is about a component library called Material UI. I'm grateful to be part of Reactor Up this year. It's the first time I give a full-length talk at any mainstream React conference. I'm very excited. Let's dive into it. In this talk, I propose we take a seat at the backstage of the project. Have you ever wondered about the challenges we face? How do we build components? Have you ever wondered about the library? Why the library is free? What makes our effort sustainable? I would be your guide in this exploration. But first, a bit about myself. I'm Olivier. I'm living in France. I've been involved for five years in the project. I've been working full time for almost two years on Material UI. I lead the project both on the company and open source sites. Here's a quick overview of the structure of the talk. First, I will start with the context Material UI is in. Second, I will explore the design principle we use when working on components taking the autocomplete as an example. And finally, I will cover the sustainability and what implies for the futures. Material UI starts with React, of course. React provides a simple yet powerful rendering engine. It puts a strong emphasis around components, the composition of components and the declarativeness. What's a component? It's as simple as a piece of interface usable in different contexts. So you have this simple yet powerful tool named React to build UIs, and more importantly, it allows us developers to break down the whole UI into smaller pieces named components, to freely combine them and reuse them. But building this component isn't trivial, at least if you aim for high levels of quality. This is where Material UIs fills a gap. Material UI provides pre-made components on top of React so you don't have to build them. It contains components of all shapes and level of abstractions. It goes from simple buttons, hooks, to complex data grids, combo boxes, or data pickers. The aim of the library is to save developers time when building their next application, website, or design systems. People can start with the default material design look the community base knows us for this fax alone. Developers gain really use, simple, performant, accessible, blah, blah, blah. I could go on and on. The important things to remember is that we aim to deliver all the things you will expect from homemade high quality code. The library started in 2014 and has been doing great since then. There is now the equivalent of five full-time developers working on the project who are financially supported by the company. The graph shows Material UI downloads as a proportion of the React downloads, React DOM downloads. It gives, it gives us an idea of the market share we have. And as you can see, it has been continuously growing. Keep in mind that React DOM during this period also grew by a factor 140. So this puts us in a unique position we have a lot of exposure to the community, which translates into resources, money, and challenges. Increasing shares in the React ecosystem with this growing number of alternative UI libraries has been a real challenge. And quite frankly, it's an exciting one. When I first worked on Material UI, I would optimize for my use cases as a front-end developer's building application. The primary goal was to have small size team between one and five de developers to build their next website, application, mobile apps. To better understand how we build components, it's important to understand the problem we are trying to solve, the users we are trying to resonate with. As a project and user base grew, so did our use cases and the use cases for using it for using the library for. On top of the original goal of small size team, we often hear people with these objectives and different contexts. So you have people with that are prototyping and they demand high velocity. You have people dropping the components into legacy applications. You have people using the component as foundation for their design systems. And we also have large scale projects that have people turn over. Supporting these use cases turns into challenges. It's impossible to answer 100% of these needs and even less with a single answer. As engineers, we know firsthand how a huge chunk of our time is to make trade-offs. 
some call it pragmatisms. So we have to decide what's important. We try to reconcile these challenges around our mission statement. We believe that building high quality application and website should be more accessible. As much as we love the no-code trend, React usage has been doubling every year since its creation. Almost. A front-end engineer, you might not want to build a data grid from scratch, but use a third-party rich component you can customize. A back-end engineer, you might not want to know how to manage an area active descendant. A UI engineer, you might want to customize the components to look exactly like your mockups. An entrepreneur, you might lack UI skills built on material design to have an appealing final product. So to serve this mission, we'll leverage the following. The documentation, first and foremost. It's the single most important thing. It's the heart of our product. Not everybody is great at user interface or user experience, but with material design, we can leverage the work of Google. They have a dedicated team of 150 members. It's huge. Theming, it should be easy. And finally, we author complex components developers can rely on, at least we try, including accessibility. So we are going to take a case study to illustrate the above and how we make trade-offs. We are going to study how the autocomplete came to life six months ago. This component solved the combo box, multi-selects, and search field problems. And even before working on a new component, we have to determine if it's the best use of our time. There are a couple of tools we can leverage to identify pain point opportunities, and mostly it's about analytics and gathering data. So in this slide, I'm sharing how we use Algolia, Google, NPM downloads, and many more, like the survey we ran two months ago, and we still have to uh, study. In the case of the autocomplete, we had an integration example with React Select and Downshift. However, we our long-term strategy is to alter complex components. So relying on the third party for building the combo box pattern isn't just part of our long-term plan. Plus, people were complaining about the size of the integration demo. So at this point, we were confident that this um, topic was an important to tackle. While the previous steps help us to pinpoint important efforts, it's not enough to take on a task. We need to know the cost. So with a rough estimate of the cost, we can then do a value cost matrix and pick the items at the top. For the autocomplete, the initial bet was 100 hours, about a month of work. We also need to make sure we have a clear road ahead of us. For instance, does it fit into the current strategy? In the case of the autocomplete, yes, we have no plan of making it part of the enterprise version of the library, and there will be more about it at the end of the talk. So we can ship it as MAT. Speaking of blockers, there is an important trade-off to consider. We have seen many people ask for the support of more components, and yet it's very risky for us to support too many low-level quality components takes us down a path where we risk to break the trust we are building with our users. We have a core belief that we should rather invest our resources in making the current components best in their classes rather than growing horizontally and prematurely. It's only when we reach a high level of quality that we will consider adding more components. And in our case, for the, the complete, at that time, we were confident it was the case. So we made it happen. Yes. A few bites of advice here. Um, it won't be a clear road toward the goal. Uh, instead, expect many dead ends. Um, it requires curiosity and patience. Usually, you will go faster by going slower, meaning uh, keeping an open mind. Uh, don't discarding ideas until it's absolutely necessary. You have to enjoy the journey. You shouldn't focus on the destination, otherwise you will uh, lose sight of your options. One thing we spend a lot of time on is running product benchmarks. We spend at least 20% of our time doing so. It's probably the single most important aspect of designing a new component. You can hardly do too much of this. Since the 90s and the mass adoptions of personal computers, 
a lot of talented people have worked on designing and implementing the same UI widgets over and over, and we can learn from them. So product benchmark is a search for the best practices in the industry. First, we will look at the grace past efforts. Uh, you can find hundreds of them. I've shared a few of them on the slide. Uh, it goes from jQuery to final products. It goes from free to pay licenses. And then we will narrow this list down to a few best items per dimension we want to benchmark. Uh, take the design with material design or else, uh, the accessibility, the APIs uh, options, the features worth implementing. Going back to what I said earlier, we have defined a 100 hours budget. And this is meant as a healthy constraint to prioritize what's important. Having done the product benchmark, we know we don't have the time to implement everything we have seen. And trust me, this can, this is frustrating uh, to retrix ourselves. So where do we start? Uh, Solomon Hikes, ex-CTO of Docker, gives the beginning of an answer with his tweet. The, the rule number one of open source is that no is temporary, and yes is forever. What does it mean? Well, that you, will, you should focus on a small set of features, and it comes with a number of advantages. First, the open source model can only sustain the development of the most common features. As far as we have experienced it, for advanced features with a small number of developers' needs, it's not sustainable. Uh, instead, we prefer offering them as part of the paid extensions, like an enterprise version. Second, each feature comes with an opportunity cost. It's time you spend upfront to develop it, it's time you will have to spend maintaining it, it's um, increase on the bundle size, and it's also increase on the API complexity that can be, because that can feel overwhelming for uh, new people. And third, it's easier to add a feature than to remove one. How do you recover from a mistake? Well, making breaking changes is not what most people like, and, and also goes in face of a people lost aversion. So implement the least amount of features, but make sure people can extend the behavior. And you don't have to worry, uh, the community is really great at identifying small gaps. If an important and foreseeable feature is missing, the developers will let us know. And even better, they will come with a valuable uh, use case for it. So now that we know how to build it and what to build, let's get started. Uh, it's truly an iterative process. It will take time um, to get everything fits together, and usually you will you will want to uh, do it incrementally, uh, moving everything from the foundation to the top. So you will sketch the API, you will have the TypeScript interfaces uh, more or less ready. You will write high-level structure for the documentation, you will prepare the demos, you will work on the core logic, and on and on until you have everything that fits together. There is one dimension we can hardly make any trade-off with, and that's the accessibility of the components. But why? 27 of the US population have a disability. A large portion can be helped with more accessible interfaces. So if we want to be pragmatic, we would want to spend an appreciable amount of time on the problem alone. And as a matter of fact, this is not the only reason why Material UI prioritize work on accessibility. Accessibility makes great user experience. Accessibility is a hard requirement for the enterprise version of Material UI we are working on. Take insurance, for instance. Since the American with Disability Act, they can be targets of lawsuits if they don't provide an accessibility interface. And the amount of cash they have available potentially make them lucrative targets. Third, it's a non-trivial problem to solve, and any problems, hard problems, come with a growth opportunity. Lastly, it helps the project to attract great contribution, contributions by making Material UI used in more demanding contexts. So we want to prioritize work on accessibility. How do we actually make progress? Well, we rely a lot on the web in accessibility initiatives. They have high quality authoring practices and examples. We also use a couple of tools, uh, screen readers, obviously, like VoiceOver or NVDA. But the reality is that we have limited resources. We rely a lot on the community to do the extra miles. Um, they have, but so far, they have been really help helping, uh, running audits and reports on new issues. 
You can find the final version of the components with accessibility on the documentation. So please try it out. And if you find any accessibility bugs, let us know. In the case of the autocomplete, the main challenge is around managing the active descendant that is inside the pop-up and displayed below the text box. So, so far we have covered the end user experience and now let's have a look at the developer experience. Designing the API is a challenge on its own. It forces us to make strong constraints and trade-offs. I believe there are roughly three different classes of options available and an infinite number of trade-offs in between these classes. The first class of options is to expose a single component. It hides all the DOM structures away. And the advantage is that it provides the simplest usage for common use cases. It just works. This resonates the, the most with the developers that have limited domain expertise. And it also sets a strong constraint. Users are less likely to make mistakes when using the API. It's a single, it's also the simplest API to implement. Um, we have access to more information, to structured data, which translates into fewer bugs and less bundle size. The second option is to expose one component per DOM node. This makes it easier to customize the look of the components because you can apply a class name, a CSS prop, you can wrap it with style component directly. It will go directly to the DOM node. It also allows the component to be composed and for instance, you can add elements in between. In turn, this, res this resonates slightly more with advanced users that would rather have more flexibility. But we also lose a bit compared to the first options. It's, this more freedoms is a double-edged sword. It's more room for mistakes. It's harder to warn against wrong usage. It's also more challenging to implement. For instance, you have to use a context to forward states between these different elements. The last class of option is to expose a hook and only hook. This makes it easier to conditionally render based on the state of the component. It also removes all dependency to styles, which makes um, which well translate into smaller bundle size. What do we lose? Well, it's more work to have a ready-to-use components. Uh, you can't have built-in styles, it's just pure lo hook logic. So this approach is worse for quick prototyping and it can also feel overwhelming for backend engineers. Where does Material UI fit into these different options? Well, historically, we have aimed for option two, which is a component as close as possible to the DOM node, uh, and that was before hooks were available. The main incentive for this option is that developers can fairly go easily to the most abstracted API. And it's impossible to go the other way around. But we don't enforce option two strictly. There are a number of components that abstract DOM nodes, um, and it's always a tough decision. And let me share you some of the factors that would um, influence us into going in this abstracted direction. Sometimes it can simplify the implementations. If we take the autocomplete as an example, providing a option array makes it easier to manage uh, the index and the focus between the different options. It can also be less variables. Uh, let's take the slider as an example. If you look at the HTML specification, if you want to build a native slider, we have to target the nested elements in the shadow DOM with CSS pseudo elements. You can't compose the logic as you can with a select and an option element. Why is that? Well, it's less variables. However, we now have hooks available and Material UI is increasingly interesting in, in offering more. As a matter of fact, the autoconflict was designed with a component API and a hook API. Let me explain why. So we have seen companies building over and over the same components, all by stitching together a bunch of inconsistent third-party dependencies, and we believe it's inefficient. Wouldn't it be better if this company could come to a single place they can trust and rely on and find all the UI components they need? Uh, hook, and we think hooks are a big part of these answers. A hook can, can help us provide unstyled components, 
it maximizes for flexibility and advanced users. The good news is that it's relatively easy for us to deliver as all our components are already written in hooks. And if we look at past effort in this direction, we can find Angular material. Three years ago, they've decided to expose a CDK package, which stands for a component developer kit. And well, if you look at the download, it has been fairly, working fairly well for them. It's a plus 30% increase in downloads and it's growing. So MatAIY is increasingly eager to continue explore on the hook side of things. Now, how does it look in practice at this whole uh, from a higher level perspective? So we try to get new components to systematically go through the lab or something equivalent. The lab is a package that does not follow Sember where each version can contain breaking changes. And this gives us the flexibility we need for handling feedbacks, at least in the early stage of the development of a component. In the case of the autocomplete, after spending 100 hours, uh, we had to wrap it up. Uh, we had to leave bug on the side. We had to leave feature on the side. What we did was we opened a pull request. We got review from the core members. Uh, we addressed the comments and we merged it. It was time to ship. And this way we get early feedback and hopefully we get a lot of them. And boy, we had issues, with issues, with issues about all the matters you, you could expect. Um, and issues are great because it means some, that we did something correctly. Only components that are not used don't get any issues. It's also an opportunity to write tests. I didn't write any tests in the first version, but as people were reporting them, we will add regression tests and increasing the coverage. So, so far we have handled more than 500 issues on the components. Um, it's 54 contributors on the hook API only. So without taking into account contribution on documentation, the component API or tests or the TypeScript different definitions. And as I'm speaking, May 2020, the component is almost ready to go into the core. Yes. So when do we move a lab component into the core? Well, we have four criteria. Um, first, it has to be used. Second, um, it has to match the quality of the other components. Third, um, we make sure it cannot be used as an incentive uh, for people to upgrade to the next major version. And lastly, uh, it has to have a low probability of requiring breaking changes. So no, different topic. Uh, I'm gonna go back to one of my first questions. Why are material UI components free to use? Um, how can the project sustain the equivalent of five full-time developers on the project? Any answer to these questions involves money and money being an instrument of change. The best answer we have found so far is through paid extensions. We have premium templates, we have premium design system, and we are now working on the feature rich um, version of the libraries for enterprises. Our flying wheel work as follows. The more open source users we have, the easier we can upsell a few of them to, to the paid extensions. The more money we generate, the more money we can invest back into the open source and improving the paid extension. Does it work? Well, Material UI is on track to more than double its revenue in 2020 compared to 2019. So at our relatively small scales, yes. What's coming next? Um, over the last few months, we have been working on making patch releases. We have made a dozen, and we're gonna start the P5 effort very soon. Um, first, we'll start with deprecations, warnings on V4, and then we'll move all our effort to the B5 branch. What do we plan for V5? Well, roughly speaking, it's about um, a good tidying up of all the small perks we've seen over the last year. It's about improving the documentation. It's about m providing an unstyled version of the library and exploring hooks at the same time. It's about making progress with a uh, style component native integration. It's about uh, providing different themes and it's also about providing an enterprise version of the library with a paid extension built on top of the existing MIT component. I think this will take us between six to 12 months. Um, what I meant by theming is to keep pushing into making customization as easy as possible. And as you can observe in this video, 
coming from the material design team, they have taken this aspect as the heart of the specifications. So ideally, we would want to expose multiple themes by default, not just material design. All theme structures can be actually used as a specification to do so. On the enterprise side, we are excited about the upcoming data grid component. We have been working on it for the last two months. We have already spent above 250 hours. It will likely need 10 times more to get something great. We are building it following the same design principle I have just presented. We will soon make a preview and a first alpha in the coming months. This is an important milestone for us. How do we invest back the money we generate? We spend it on research and development. We hire. So I'm excited about the following. We are looking for great front-end developers to accelerate our mission. If you have an excellent expertise in the enterprise or open source component landscape, let us know. We would love to talk. All of this was made possible by our talented core team, so a big thanks to them. After this talk, I hope you have learned a few principles you could apply at work. I hope that you get a better sense of the level of care and effort it takes to build a great UI library and how much material UI value the quality of the documentation, the quality of the components, the accessibility, and the customizability. Thank you for listening. Um, one of the questions that we had right off the bat in the YouTube chat is, uh, what are some product benchmarking tools that you could recommend or UI benchmarking tools? Um, yeah, so we have over, well, the years uh, had the chance to look for a lot of alternative solutions. And each time we will keep each link into a Trello board. Um, one link I can recommend is Adele by UXPIN, where they list um, dozens of uh, libraries. Uh, so I could share, let me find the link. I can share the whole list we are using. Um, can I send it on the chat? Yep. Yep. And then we'll, yep. sure. we'll plug it into the right places. Cool. I'm doing that. So yeah, it was interesting to hear that 20% um, of, I guess, web users are disabled. This is um, a big number. And I would assume that by building your UI components to be accessible, that you're doing a lot more testing <clears throat> and making additional precautions or taking additional precautions. Can you talk a little bit more about that? So yeah, so on the accessibility side, um, so I think you're right. Uh, I think we underestimate the number of people that are using uh, accessibility tools. Uh, it can be as simple as increasing the font size on your browser, uh, which should be well supported. Um, so how we tend to use that? Well, we, well, we keep up with the latest uh, information on the topic. Um, Obviously, uh, we are using accessibility tools. Um, so we do the most we can, but for us, it has been very efficient to ask for the community to do it. So from time to time, yes. we have people running exhaustive uh, audits. And just because they have to do it anyway for their application, uh, they have to make sure uh, the whole page is accessible. And so they're gonna test each element on the page. And usually when they see issues, they're gonna report back and we leverage that. Uh, so I think this is why we don't have to spend that much time on actual testing because we have this huge user base of people that are doing it for us. And to piggyback off that question a little bit, um, you say that you have, um, I guess, users out there that are that are doing some of this accessibility testing. I'm sure that you do a lot of it in-house as well, but how can people, um, you also mentioned that you guys have a lab, which is, I guess, a special uh, build of your material UI, which is a, a little bit further ahead that might have breaking um, changes in it? Yep, exactly. So the main difference is we can make breaking changes. So everything new goes to the lab. And yeah. there, people can experiment and try different things. Um, where I know we have about eight components. So yeah, to further continue on the direction of how we test accessibility, um, one thing we do is on the testing side, um, we are using testing library. Uh, we are actually migrating from Enzyme to testing library uh, to 
use as many accessibility features in the assertions as well as in the actions, in the events we fire. Uh, this has been for us a huge help um, on making components more accessible. Yeah, I'm seeing here on your site, it's um, forward slash components, forward slash, I guess, about the lab, or yep, is there an easier way to get? Perfect. Yeah, so if anyone wants to go and check that out, this is a, a very interesting way to get uh, kind of involved with Material UI if you want to be a contributor or if you want to help test out the yeah, application and the, and the components. Um, exactly. um, we just had some thanks inside of the uh, YouTube. Okay. See, thank you for all of you. Thank you for your team. Uh, you make it easy to focus on the things I want to be focusing on. <laughs> so, and uh, as well, I just have a, a lot of um, respect for Material UI, and um, I don't have any more questions uh, unless anyone on the panel has some. No, no, right no uh, I just want to. Sorry, go on. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, well. I, I do. I, had, I do have one one more question, um, and it's I don't really know how to phrase this question yet, but um, hooks have changed a lot about how we develop our React apps and, and how we build APIs for components. Yeah. Um, I, I know you cover, uh, talked about it a little bit, but how has that changed the way that you guys build components and how, how do you see it changing um, the components, you know, maybe in the next year or so? Yeah, um, I think before hooks, we have render props. Um, this was yeah. kind of a way we were uh, solving a similar problems. But as I'm seeing moving forward, well, I think front-end developers will use more hooks. Uh, we will, I probably think we'll see the emergence of a UI library, which is only using hooks and getting more traction for the front-ends. Uh, as far as I've seen it, uh, it doesn't cover the whole problems because usually you have then to handle the heavy lifting on styling it. Um, so from my perspective, how hooks are helping material UI success is by allowing us to um, move further away, providing a layer of abstractions where people don't have to um, argue about the styling solutions we should be using. Sure. Uh, should we be using emotion style, uh, I don't know, style components, uh, class names with CSS modules, um, and so on. So for us, I think, could be the beginning of um, people uh, coming together and uh, building for the first time a UI libraries uh, that can be actually shared and you reuse massively yep. uh, because uh, you don't have to worry about, I mean, if you have to uh, runtime engine for CSS in GS, uh, that can be a, a strong issues for your performances for the performance of your application. Yes. So people then are fragmented uh, because of that. So Shareability I think is the uh, emergence of one UI library um, around Oops. Yep. Yeah, that, that was my last question. Um, did the panel have any other questions here? Um, John? John? No, nah, well, no, no questions really. Just want to say thank you. I'm a big fan of Material UI myself. Yeah, we yeah. use it on a lot of my web projects, and yeah, I just want to say great job, really. You make a thank lot of us look Martin. like good developers, good good designers too. <laughs> so thank you very Pretty much. Pretty much, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, All right. When are you going to read the first pro components? Do you know? Sorry, I've lost. Is is that for Oliver? Um, yeah. You said you were going to release some uh, enterprise components. Well, when can we expect it? Are you I there? Question, I'm sorry. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, the enterprise components. When are you guys planning on uh, releasing those? Uh, I think we can, uh, maybe in six months. Um, we are prioritizing the data grid, which is a main component that most people are looking for. Yes. Um, then uh, we'll see there will be a bit of, I think, forms um, layouts, uh, scheduler, uh, tree view. Um, I mean, there is a long list of components we can actually cover. Uh, the main challenge is, uh, for now, I think, is to get it one right, and then, yeah, we'll see. Eric, do you have any advice for uh, Olivier, given that you work on the <laughs> well, um, the UI? No. <laughs> well, what, what to no, do I, or, what, I, I, or what not to do? I, I, <laughs> You guys put me in a tough position here. So, no, the, the one thing I was wondering when you talk about potentially um, 
Well, well, well I, I guess I would, I would say, do you have any plans to make your components available as, as like a base level to, to make it a lot easier for people to build on top of? Because um, I feel like if people are going to pay for components, they, they probably want something like that. Um, I, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to hold back on, on talking too much about that because <laughs> I don't work for them anymore. And, uh, and I really respect their product. And <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, that's a good question is, you know, uh, giving, uh, like, like reach UI, like you've, you've probably seen reach UI. It's, it's very interesting how they package, uh, just, just what you need, uh, the functionality of the components without giving you a bunch of extra style. Do you have any plans to do anything like that? Um, or, or how how do you maybe see the enterprise uh, components being different than what you've already provided? Yeah. Uh, okay. So there are a couple of uh, different topics. So on the end style part, we have people asking for it. Uh, so it's definitely something we are eager to cover. Um, nice thing about that is that all it should be asking for us to do is removing the styles and providing a different package. Um, and we are wondering about should we go component layer or should we go a bit deep, uh, lower level with hooks? Uh, so we are um, wondering about this two approach. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, actually, that would be interesting. Uh, and we have since that done and it seems to work well. Um, yep. And one of the reasons why we want to do that is because we also have uh, this requirement for enterprise where people might not be using material design. Uh, so material design is, well, it's leading used design systems out there, but it's only like at most 30% of what's used. So there was, uh, it's not what's most used. So we have to find a way to provide different themes um, and design systems. Um, yep. So yeah, so there is a uh, couple of dimensions we have to cover. Um, so we have to start from the simplest feature that and nobody will want to pay for and that we actually what we have been doing for the last four years uh, so making all this baseline of components available and then yes. it's really advanced and well as far as we have seen it we cannot really make it sustainable we don't have the resources to go uh, buy, uh, build like a data grid for one year and make it available um, people will be opening issues. Um, and at some point we just lost interest and moved to something else. So we have to find a way to make it sustainable. So this is why uh, we have this double layer of um, free for a uh, whole baseline of free, simple foundations. And then as we go to more advanced features, uh, we're gonna be looking at GPL licenses or enterprise licenses uh, to make it sustainable in the long term. Uh, so we don't have, I mean, in two years, we still want, in five years, we still want to be here um, pushing further what we are doing. Perfect. That's great. Um, we look forward to seeing uh, everything that you guys do over the next year. And uh, hopefully at React Europe next year, we'll be able to talk about these things. Yeah, we see. Yeah, V5 is coming. So hopefully we'll have it. All ready. right. Thanks, Eric. All right. Thanks, yep. Eric, yeah. Back over to Bye. you, Patrick. And thanks. Yeah. Thanks. John. Cheers. Bye-bye. Yeah.